Gentlemen, we open the show with my handsome Italian paisano, Sergio Franchi. So let's have a fun. The Ed Sullivan Show is still regarded as one of the best late night shows in television history. It provided a springboard for many entertainers, notably singers, who went on to become legendary characters in the music industry. Everybody tells me so can buy me love. Many spectacular singers who are still renowned today owe their first break to The Ed Sullivan Show. However, it's important to note that, despite being a vital conduit for talent, Ed Sullivan had his fair share of aversions among his guests. Sullivan, who was known for his occasionally prickly temper and demanding demeanor, didn't always get along with the artists he presented. Here is all you need to know about Ed Sullivan, his show, and singers that he had clashes with. Number 10. Early Life Ed Sullivan, a legendary figure in American entertainment, was born on September 28, 1901, in New York City's lively Harlem district. His parents, Elizabeth F., and Peter Arthur Sullivan instilled in him a strong love of music, as well as a strong interest in athletics. Unfortunately, his sickly twin brother, Daniel, had a tragically brief life, lasting only a few months. Sullivan spent his formative years in Port Chester, New York, where the Sullivan family lived in a charming red brick mansion at 53 Washington Street. The Sullivans, who were of Irish descent, were a close-knit tribe that appreciated the pleasures of music. Their house was full of songs because they frequently gathered around the piano, sang delightful tunes, and spun vinyl records that filled the room with lovely noises. This early exposure to the arts had a lasting impression on young Ed, laying the road for his future in the entertainment world. The seeds of Sullivan's renown and success, however, were not sowed only in the realms of music and the arts. During his high school years at Port Chester High School, when he became a sports phenomenon, he displayed amazing athletic skills. Sullivan received 12 athletic letters, excelling in a wide range of disciplines. He was a tough halfback on the football field and a skilled guard on the basketball floor. He sprinted to victory in track and field, leaving competitors in his wake. But probably his most astonishing accomplishment was on the baseball diamond, when he donned the catcher's gear and became team captain. The baseball team won multiple championships under his leadership. Ed Sullivan entered the realm of journalism after a successful career in sports and the arts. His career began with a position at the Port Chester Daily Item, a small newspaper where he had already dabbled with writing sports journalism in high school. Soon after graduating, he began his career as a professional journalist. He began an exciting new journey in 1919 when he joined the Hartford Post. However, this promising career was cut short when the newspaper folded during Sullivan's first week. Sullivan's journalistic journey was unaffected by the setback. He got work as a sports reporter at the New York Evening Mail, which, however, closed its doors in 1923, just like his prior job. He negotiated a series of news positions with numerous magazines, including the Associated Press, the Philadelphia Bulletin, the Morning World, the Morning Telegraph, the New York Bulletin, and the leader, with unrelenting drive. Each experience sharpened his talents and established him as a respected journalist. When he joined the New York Evening Graphic in 1927, Ed Sullivan took advantage of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. His abilities quickly propelled him to the post of sports editor when he was hired as a sports writer. His career took a crucial turn in 1929, however, when Walter Winchell, a prominent figure in entertainment journalism, moved to the Daily Mirror. Sullivan was then hired as the New York Evening Graphics Broadway columnist. As a result, he chose to broaden his horizons, moving to the New York Daily News, the city's largest tabloid, in search of a larger readership. Sullivan's Daily News column, Little Old New York, centered on Broadway performances and gossip, giving readers a glimpse into the world of entertainment. Along with his writing, he dabbled in radio, providing entertainment news broadcasts. Ed Sullivan's diverse talents were highlighted even further in 1933, when he wrote and performed in the film, Mr. Broadway. With this one-of-a-kind cinematic experience, he was able to lead the audience through the colorful panorama of New York nightlife, presenting them to a slew of artists and superstars. 
The film not only highlighted his charisma and narrative abilities, but also signified his crossover from print and radio to visual media. Number 9. The Beginning of the Ed Sullivan Show The year 1948 was a watershed moment in the life of legendary producer Marlo Lewis. Marlo Lewis set out on a quest to bring an incredible talent into the spotlight, with unrelenting dedication and a vision that sparkled with promise. He was looking for Ed Sullivan, a name that would soon become synonymous with entertainment greatness. Marlo Lewis began on a passionate search via pure charisma and an unwavering trust in Sullivan's star potential. He successfully persuaded CBS, a formidable network, to take a risk on Ed Sullivan. As a result of his persistent efforts, a television phenomenon was born, a show that captivated audiences and shaped the very core of American entertainment. In June of 1948, the Globe watched the world premiere of a show that would soon become a household name, Toast of the Town. Ed Sullivan first appeared on television in the hallowed halls of Maxine Elliott's Theater in the center of New York. He welcomed a country of viewers into his world, setting the stage for an astonishing adventure with a heart full of hopes and dreams. But the narrative doesn't end there. It was just the start of an amazing ascension. The popularity of the play skyrocketed, and its incandescent attractiveness could not be restrained within the bounds of its first location. The show's magic necessitated a larger stage, one that could accommodate the entire cast. The Toast of the Town took its next major leap on January 1953, and it was a triumphant jump. The Ed Sullivan Theater, now bearing the essence of a man who had transcended the confines of entertainment, became a holy ground for artists and performers. The beauty of Elvis Presley's swinging hips, the Beatles' earth-shattering debut, and the sheer brilliance of numerous superstars who graced its stage would be witnessed. With each song, step, and smile, the theater rang with the spirit of Ed Sullivan and the dreamer who catapulted him to fame. This move was more than just a change in sight. It was a monument to the enormous success of Toast of the Town and its host's tenacious spirit. It was the turning point, the time when a former radio playhouse was revived as the center of American entertainment. The Ed Sullivan Theater would remain a creative hotspot, with renowned talk show hosts like David Letterman and Stephen Colbert following in the footsteps of the man whose name graced the marquee. Number 8. Ed Sullivan vs. Elvis Presley Ed Sullivan, a conservative icon of the entertainment industry, and Elvis Presley, the unabashed king of rock and roll, found themselves in the thick of a cultural clash during Elvis's appearances on The Ed Sullivan Show. This clash of cultures and ideals defined their relationships and emphasized the dramatic contrasts between the two personas. The iconic variety show's host, Ed Sullivan, was determined to portray a pleasant and family-friendly image to his enormous audience. His objective was to appeal to a wide range of audiences, ensuring that his presentation was appropriate for all ages. Elvis Presley, on the other hand, was at his peak in the music industry. With his provocative dance routines and raw, electric musical style, he was a revolutionary musician who represented revolt and controversy. The conflict between these two personalities stemmed from Sullivan's conservative ideals and his misgivings about Elvis's provocative performances. He was concerned about possible criticism from his more traditional and conservative viewers. Sullivan was initially hesitant to feature Elvis on his show, fearing that the controversial young performer would contradict the family-friendly image he had carefully created. Sullivan eventually relented and offered an invitation to the rising singer, acknowledging Elvis's great popularity and the magnetic pull he possessed for the youth. This decision was essential not only for Elvis, but also for music and popular culture history. Elvis's appearances on The Ed Sullivan Show helped launch him into the national scene, dramatically increasing his fame and laying the groundwork for his legendary reputation in the music world. During these appearances, Ed Sullivan and Elvis reportedly had tense interactions as their worlds intersected. Sullivan, known for his restrained and buttoned-up approach, found it difficult to keep up with Elvis's effervescent and charming personality. On stage, the King's lively energy, which was second nature to him, may have made Sullivan uneasy and a little put off. The contrast between Sullivan's old-school, stiff performance 
and Elvis's joyful, boundary-pushing stage presence was palpable. Elvis, who was used to performing in more casual and uninhibited settings, may have felt constricted by the Ed Sullivan stage's stringent production restrictions and limited movement. The format of the program, which was intended for a family audience, did not easily accommodate Elvis's electric approach. Despite the pressures and limits, Elvis managed to create engaging performances that captivated audiences and altered the course of his career. Number 7. Bo Diddley Bo Diddley was a maverick artist who aggressively pushed the frontiers of music, known for his inventive rhythms and breakthrough guitar skills. His sound was a unique and exciting blend of blues, rhythm and blues, and rock. By 1955, he was at the vanguard of a musical movement that was questioning the time's established norms. When Bo Diddley was hired for an appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show, the host had certain expectations. Sullivan wanted Bo Diddley to play a Tennessee Ernie Ford tune as part of the show's usual structure. Bo Diddley, on the other hand, was steadfast in his determination to maintain his musical individuality. He flatly refused to comply with Sullivan's instructions, instead singing his famous hit, Bo Diddley. As a result, he valued his artistic integrity while also preserving the core of the nascent rock and roll movement. Bo Diddley's steadfast stance irritated Ed Sullivan, who famously observed that Bo Diddley was the first black boy who ever double-crossed him. This disrespectful remark severely outraged Bo Diddley, who stated unequivocally that he would never appear on the show again. The confrontation between Ed Sullivan and Bo Diddley highlighted the conflict between artistic autonomy and the limits of mass entertainment. Number 6. The Doors The strained relationship between Ed Sullivan and The Doors, particularly their enigmatic frontman Jim Morrison, is a well-documented and emblematic chapter in the history of rock and roll. This discord between the conservative television host and the rebellious rock band was a microcosm of the generation gap and cultural shifts that defined the 1960s. The Doors were psychedelic rock pioneers led by the flamboyant, unpredictable, and frequently contentious Jim Morrison. Their music and Morrison's stage presence exemplified the countercultural upheaval that was taking place at the time. Ed Sullivan, on the other hand, stood for conventional values and family-friendly entertainment, making it difficult for him to completely accept The Doors' confrontational music and Morrison's unrepentant onstage attitude. When The Doors were set to play on The Ed Sullivan Show in 1967, Sullivan made a request that would become significant. He requested that the lyrics to their successful song, Light My Fire, be changed to make it more socially acceptable. Sullivan was particularly offended by the usage of the word higher in the song, which he felt implied drug use. During practice, the band hesitantly agreed to the request. However, when it came time for the live performance, Jim Morrison defied the earlier agreement and sang the original lyrics. Because of this audacious act of defiance, the doors were barred from ever participating in the show again. Morrison's brazen defiance enraged Ed Sullivan, and the event caused the television presenter tremendous public embarrassment. The conflict over the song's lyrics effectively ended any hope of The Doors and Sullivan having a healthy relationship. It emphasized the band's countercultural position, Morrison's unashamed disobedience against established norms, and Sullivan's need for control and conformance to mainstream standards. Despite the squabbles and expulsion from Sullivan's show, the Doors' participation became a watershed moment in rock history. It emphasized the growing gulf between the conservative establishment represented by Ed Sullivan and the developing youth-driven counterculture during the 1960s. Now let's check out today's subscriber pick. Ed Sullivan couldn't stand this singer and he made it obvious. This photograph of Ed Sullivan with the infamous Swedish-American actress and singer credited as Anne Margaret has been stirring controversy since the days of black and white TV. She appeared in The Ed Sullivan Show and sang super hit songs, Bye Bye Birdie and Baby Won't You Please Come Home. There has been speculation that Sullivan wasn't a big fan of Anne Margaret and that there was some kind of beef between the two celebrities. However, neither came forward with any details about their strained relationship. It's not surprising since Sullivan was known for getting into fights with his show guests, particularly the ones who were sensational singers. 
Was there a pattern in his behavior that we missed? Tell us what you think in the comments below. Number 5. Bob Dylan Bob Dylan, known for his profound lyrics and thought-provoking music, was a symbol of the emerging counterculture movement that reshaped the landscape of folk and rock music. His songs were anti-establishment anthems, articulating social and political issues and questioning the established quo, distinguishing him as a beacon of shifting cultural tides. Dylan was at the pinnacle of his popularity and impact in the mid-1960s, when he was invited to play on The Ed Sullivan Show. At the time, the show offered a big platform for visibility, but it was hosted by Ed Sullivan, who represented a more traditional and conservative entertainment sector. Sullivan, who was known for adhering to conventional rules, found it difficult to completely comprehend or embrace Dylan's unique approach and the contentious lyrical topics that underlay his songs. Sullivan's name was founded on showcasing performances that aligned with a more conventional and popular image, but Dylan used his art to encourage thinking, criticize the system, and fight for change. This fundamental difference in method and ideology produced the seeds of conflict between the two. The critical moment of tension occurred during Dylan's rehearsals for The Ed Sullivan Show, when he decided to sing his politically charged song, John Birch Paranoid Blues. This song was a humorous satire on the current political situation, particularly the Red Scare and the fear of communism. Its content was too contentious for mainstream television. Surprisingly, Ed Sullivan did not appear to be bothered by this strong indictment of the era's paranoia. The show's producer, on the other hand, was less forgiving and insisted that Bob Dylan sing a new, less inflammatory tune. Dylan refused to compromise his devotion to his craft and message. In a gesture of disobedience, he canceled his entire performance. This decision effectively ended Ed Sullivan's connection with the iconic singer-songwriter. The episode was a watershed moment in both of their careers. It was a declaration of Bob Dylan's commitment to creative integrity and the uncompromising nature of his work. It represented a failure to adapt to changing circumstances, as well as the growing impact of artists who used their music as a vehicle for social and political change, according to Ed Sullivan. Number 4. Sam Cooke Ed Sullivan's relationship with the legendary soul and R&B singer-songwriter Sam Cooke began on a promising note, but eventually devolved into strife and disillusionment. Sam Cooke, known for his soulful and beautiful voice, was set to appear on The Ed Sullivan Show. He spent a significant amount of time rehearsing and preparing for the play, wanting to create a spectacular performance on this prominent stage. But fate had other intentions. Due to unanticipated circumstances, the show's filming had run far beyond schedule, necessitating an early conclusion. Unfortunately, Sam Cooke's concert was abruptly cut short a disappointing and disheartening turn of events for the gifted musician. Understandably, this unexpected disruption hurt him tremendously, leaving him with a sour taste in his mouth about his performance on The Ed Sullivan Show. Following the altercation, Sam Cooke decided not to return to the show's stage, and a profound quiet descended between the two men. Ed Sullivan, on the other hand, was eager to shift the responsibility elsewhere, as if Sam Cooke's dissatisfaction was unwarranted. Nonetheless, Ed Sullivan acknowledged the gravity of the situation and issued a public apology, noting the interruption to the performance and its impact on Sam Cooke. This gesture, while insufficient to repair the relationship, revealed Sullivan's comprehension of the problem and desire to accept responsibility for it. Ironically, the tape of Sam Cooke's performance on The Ed Sullivan Show is today considered one of the iconic singer's rare preserved video recordings. While it recalls their sad feud, it also immortalizes Cook's extraordinary talent and charisma. Number 3. Ed Sullivan's Feud with Buddy Holly The relationship between Ed Sullivan and Buddy Holly, a bright and innovative rock and roll artist of the late 1950s, was fraught with tension and turmoil. Buddy Holly's life and career were brutally cut short, but it was his appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show that brought his talent and influence to a wider audience. The crux of their disagreement was Ed Sullivan's refusal to allow Buddy Holly and the Crickets to play Oh Boy. 
This music choice seemed to irritate Sullivan, resulting in conflict between the singer and the presenter. Furthermore, it was clear that the group was uninterested in performing on the show, which irritated Ed Sullivan even more. Buddy Holly was remembered for his creative sound, a fresh and revolutionary blend of rockabilly, country, and rhythm and blues. This sonic blend was a break from the usual entertainment acts that Sullivan was more comfortable with. Ed Sullivan frequently had a clear concept of how he wanted performers to express themselves on his show, which was based on a more traditional and planned style. Furthermore, as an emerging artist, Holly desired more creative authority and artistic independence, which clashed with Sullivan's desire to exert strict control over the performances included in his show. Sullivan was notorious for enforcing strict standards on musicians, regulating everything from song selection to dancing and wardrobe. These limits collided with Holly's artistic vision and honesty, resulting in an awkward interaction during Holly's debut on The Ed Sullivan Show. This dispute generated a fairly stressful atmosphere behind the scenes, with Holly's demand for creative freedom clashing with Sullivan's rigid show framework. Despite their poor relationship, Buddy Holly's appearances on the show were indisputably influential in his career. They aided in introducing his creative music to a larger and more general audience, ultimately cementing his enduring place in rock and roll history. Buddy Holly's life was tragically cut short in an aircraft crash, making his appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show one of the few recorded performances of this renowned singer we have. Despite the tension and conflicts, this brief stint in the spotlight has become a vital historical record of a creative genius who left an unforgettable influence on the world of music. Number 2. Personal Life Ed Sullivan, best known as a television host and producer, had a complex and complicated personal life that was entwined with his professional career. His connections and marriage to Sylvia Weinstein, which was not without difficulties, were key aspects of his personal life. When Sullivan met Sylvia Weinstein in 1926, his life changed forever. They began a romantic adventure, but Sylvia opted early on to shield her relationship with Sullivan from her family's criticism. She concealed Sullivan's Catholic background by telling her family she was dating a Jewish man called Ed Solomon. This disparity posed a big hurdle to their developing relationship, as both of their families were strongly opposed to interfaith marriage. Their romance saw ups and downs over the next three years as they handled the intricacies of hiding their love from disapproving family members. Their developing romance was hampered by society's standards and family circumstances of the period. Finally, Sullivan and Sylvia defied the obstacles and conventional expectations by marrying in a city hall ceremony on April 28, 1930. Their love triumphed over the difficulties they encountered during their courtship. Eight months later, Sylvia gave birth to their daughter, Elizabeth, dubbed Betty. Betty's name was inspired by Sullivan's mother, who died the previous year. It was a touching memorial to his late mother. The Sullivan's involvement with television did not end with Ed Sullivan. At 1952, Betty Sullivan married Bob Precht, the producer of The Ed Sullivan Show. This marriage established an important professional link between the Sullivan family and the world of entertainment. The Sullivan's personal and business lives were linked. The family rented a suite of rooms at the Hotel Del Monaco in 1944, leaving behind their old house at the Hotel Astor on Times Square, where they had lived for several years. Sullivan, ever the professional, hired a suite next to the family's living quarters and used it as an office. He supervised the activities of the Ed Sullivan Show within these walls until the show's termination in 1971. Sullivan was uncompromising in his devotion to his craft. Following each performance, he would phone his wife Sylvia to solicit her feedback and thoughts. Her opinion was essential to him because it reflected the close relationship between their personal and professional lives. The Sullivans were well known for their active social life. They frequented some of New York City's most prestigious clubs and restaurants, such as the Stork Club, Danny's Hideaway, and Jimmy Kelly's. Sullivan's amiable nature and wide circle of friends encompassed many celebrities and even U.S. presidents. Aside from that, he had the privilege of receiving audiences with popes, demonstrating the breadth of his influence in the entertainment industry and beyond. 
Sylvia Sullivan passed away on March 16, 1973, at Mount Sinai Hospital, leaving the Sullivan family with yet another tragic loss. Her tragic demise was caused by a ruptured aorta, marking the end of a chapter in the life of one of television's most legendary people. Number 1. Ed Sullivan, The Legend Will Live On By 1971, The Ed Sullivan Show, long a television entertainment powerhouse, was struggling with falling ratings. Recognizing the need to refresh its roster, CBS took the painful choice to terminate the show in March 1971. This was a watershed moment in television history, especially because it coincided with a broader trend known as the Rural Purge, which saw several long-running shows go during the 1970 and 1971 seasons. The decision to end the show did not sit well with Ed Sullivan, who had been in charge of it for decades. He refused to host the three additional months of scheduled broadcasts, expressing his displeasure with CBS's decision. In response to his refusal, the network aired replays of the remaining programs, symbolizing the end of an era. A final broadcast, in Ed Sullivan's absence, aired in June, and it was an emotional time for those who had grown up with the show. Although The Ed Sullivan Show was no longer a regular part of his schedule, Ed Sullivan remained involved with the network in numerous roles. His continued presence on television spoke to his importance in the medium. On June 1973, he returned to the screen to host a special marking the program's 25th anniversary. This event allowed him to revisit some of the show's most iconic scenes and honor its enduring legacy. Ed Sullivan suffered a personal health issue in the years following his final broadcast appearance. He received a diagnosis that would change the trajectory of his life in early September 1974. He was diagnosed with advanced esophageal cancer by medical authorities. Doctors had little hope for his recovery given the severity of his disease, and the family took the difficult decision to keep the diagnosis a secret from Sullivan himself. His prognosis was a devastating blow, especially for a guy who had spent his whole life in the spotlight. Sullivan, a lifetime smoker, ascribed his illness to what he thought was another complication from a long struggle with gastrointestinal ulcers. Unbeknownst to him, his cancer battle was a separate and far more deadly foe. It was a sobering reminder of the toll that long-term smoking may have on one's health. Tragically, Ed Sullivan's health soon deteriorated, and he passed away on October 13, 1974, in New York's Lenox Hill Hospital. His death signaled the end of an era in television, leaving an unparalleled legacy. The news of his demise rippled throughout the country, and his funeral was attended by 2,000 people at New York's stately saint, Patrick's Cathedral. The day of his funeral was solemn, with chilly, wet weather providing an appropriate backdrop for a man who had made an indelible stamp on American television. Ed Sullivan was laid to rest in a tomb at Ferncliff Cemetery in Hartsdale, New York. The site is a monument to his lasting impact on the entertainment industry and his place in American popular culture. Sullivan's influence was not limited to television. He was also honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. His star, Hollywood BLVED, bears his name as a permanent homage to his services to the industry. We hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see you in the next one.